to share with you just two short YouTube videos to illustrate that this is becoming, uh, the, the changing nature of the media landscape is that we can, as individuals, create online videos and we can get our, our uh, ideas out there even more and generate more conversation that way. And you can see, so this video has been viewed about 100 times. And it features uh, Kelly Bernal of the Rudd Center. This is Christina Fiore of MedPage Today. New York's Mayor Michael Bloomberg wants soda off the list of goods that city and state residents can buy with food stamps. Bloomberg asked the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which controls the food stamp program, for permission to institute a two-year ban so researchers can study its health impacts. Dr. Kelly Brownell, director of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity at Yale, is a proponent of the plan. Well, this is a courageous move and a controversial one, but one that I fully support. The, the government shouldn't be in the business of buying things that make people ill because the government has to pay for that and all of us do because we support the government. And there's very clear scientific literature linking sugar sweetened beverages with risks for bad things like obesity and diabetes. So the government is, this program is called the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And nobody says that there's nutrition in soda. It's basically empty calories. So the government shouldn't help, have to help pay for that. Brownell says it shouldn't be seen as a reduction in benefits. One thing this program is not is a reduction in benefits. People would still have the same amount of benefits, and hopefully it, it could get used to buy healthier foods, which benefits everybody, including the people who are buying the food. Government now doesn't allow people to use funding that they get from the government but to buy things that can make them sick, like to, tobacco or alcohol. So why should food that makes them sick be supported by the government? And there are plenty of other choices. People can still use the money to buy water, to buy juices, to buy diet drinks, just not sugar-sweetened beverages. In her blog, nutrition expert Marianne Nessel raised some concerns shared by many in the anti-hunger community that the policy is unfair. I certainly understand the objections uh, by the hunger community to the uh, proposal by New York City and New York State because they don't want benefits to be cut back and they don't want poor people to be treated in ways that discriminate against them. Um, I don't believe that this falls into that category because the, the soda companies market really heavily toward the population in general, but poor people in particular, and it's just not fair. And if the government can, be, can set up a program that provides incentives for people to buy food and helps curb hunger but promotes healthy foods, then we'll be a lot better off than if it helps promote unhealthy foods. The Bloomberg administration has launched or has attempted to launch several other health policy initiatives, including an overhaul of cafeteria food in public schools and a soda tax. For MedPage Today, I'm Christina Fiore. So that's one online video that presents some of the concerns related to this policy, but you can see it's it's much more geared, I would argue, towards the positive side, the you know being in favor of this policy. But pretty easy for her to create. Uh, this isn't complicated, and she's got you know one compelling interview source that she's uh, presenting this information to, and getting his feedback, and then she puts it online on YouTube, and people watch it, and it influences what they think about this issue. Secondly, we have more of a community. Uh, generated video, and uh, I want you to pay particular attention to the various visuals that this gentleman uses as he's talking about New York wants to put a ban on food stamps for sodas. You heard me right. New York asks to bar use of food stamps to buy sodas. Mayor Michael Bloomberg sought federal permission on Wednesday to bar New York City's 1.7 million recipients of food stamps from using them to buy soda or other sugar drinks. The mayor requested a ban for two years to study whether it would have a positive impact on health and whether a permanent ban would be merited. That's crazy. New York State, which administers food stamps locally, signed on the request, which was received by the Agriculture Department on Wednesday evening. And in 2004, the Agriculture Department denied the same kind of request by Minnesota to prevent food stamp recipients from buying junk food. The department said that the plan, which focused on candy and soda, among other foods, was based on questionable merits 
and would perpetrate the myth that food stamp users made poor shopping decisions. I don't know about this one. City statistics released last month show that nearly 40% of public school children in kindergarten through eighth grade were overweight or obese, and the obesity rates were substantially higher in poor neighborhoods. City studies show that consumption of sugared beverages is consistently higher in those neighborhoods. In other words, poor people are fatter than everyone else, so we got to blame sugar. I don't know. The ban would affect beverages with more than 10 calories per 8 ounces and would exclude fruit juices without added sugars, milk products, and milk substitutes. So the word sugar from fruit juice is good, but anything else is bad. A 12-ounce soda has 150 calories and the equivalent of 10 packets of sugar, according to the health department. City health officials say that drinking 12 ounces of soda a day can make a person gain 15 pounds a year. We don't know where Mayor Bloomberg and his people got the claims or the statistics, but nevertheless, New York wants to put a ban on the sale of sugary drinks and sodas with food stamps, that is. Let me know what you think. You can hit me up on my Facebook at Quadia Shakur or call my message line, 206-279-0516. It's yours truly, the unruly Quadia Shakur. Real talk from a hip-hop perspective. You can see, I mean, a very, uh, very different approach, but similarly, he's outlined the plan, he's talking about the issues, what might concern people, and um, asking for people's feedback. Uh, an opinion brief that was featured in this publication called The Week recently uh, covered all the various opinions uh, on this soda um, legislation, and he said that Basically, these are the, these are the main pull-out quotes, and he said, nanny state meddling to the extreme, is this gentleman's point of view, the moderate voice. But then this person says, wrong to waste taxpayer money on junk food. Someone else says, do we really want to sacrifice some degree of liberty for the war on soda pot? So just showing you the range of perspectives on this, um, on this policy initiative. But what, is, what does this basically tell us? We still don't know what the USDA is going to say about this proposal. We're still waiting on a formal decision from them. But what it does tell us is that all of this publicity, all the people talking about this, means that they obviously care about the issue. It's important. And um, you know that sends a message to USDA that perhaps even if they, regardless if they decide to accept New York City's proposal or not, it tells them that this is important, that people are really concerned about obesity in this country. It affects a lot of people. There are some social justice issues. We've got to be careful about how we address it, but maybe what we're doing isn't enough. And uh, you know, we might be considering some different proposals in the future in order to combat this problem. So a good media advocacy example, and we'll see where it goes. So that's all I have prepared for you all, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. And I would like to say definitely try to make the other two seminars this semester because they're going to be really good and they're going to apply the skills, some of the skills that we talked about in here, like newsletters. The next one is focused on how do you write a newsletter for a nonprofit organization, which is a really useful skill. And many of you will find that you'll be doing that in your future careers if you're not doing it already. And then after that, we have um, Terry Truncal from the Times Picayune coming to discuss how one can successfully write a letter to the editor in an op-ed and get it published. So, you know, today we're just sort of introducing the concepts and telling you that as public health practitioners, you have the credentials and you really have the responsibility to be active media advocates and you can make a difference.